enjoying the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit. A number of years ago, our family drove across France to Switzerland and we drove through the night using these smaller roads through towns rather than the motorways. It was a beautiful, memorable journey because through the night, many of the little villages and towns have floodlights lighting up their oldest and loveliest buildings. Now, as we drove, we didn't go through those towns saying, oh, what amazing floodlights. No, we admired the beauty of the buildings, which was precisely the point of those floodlights. And the role of the Holy Spirit could be compared to a floodlight. He shines light to reveal the glory of Christ. In John chapter 6, verse 14, Jesus says, He, the Holy Spirit, will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. The night before Jesus was crucified, he warned his disciples that he was soon to leave them. But he promised that they would receive the Holy Spirit as their counsellor, one to draw alongside them. And he said that it was for their good that he was going away because when he left them, he would send the Holy Spirit. So we're gonna read John chapter 16 and verses five to eight and 12 to 14. John chapter 16, verse five. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, why are you going? Because I've said these things, you are filled with grief, but I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room and Jesus was warning his followers that he would be taken away and after his departure, they would have to expect vicious persecution themselves. He said, if the world hates you, bear in mind it hated me first. He said, anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. And Jesus wouldn't be there to help them. And the disciples were rightly terrified. But Jesus reassured them. They didn't have to be afraid because he was going to send them another helper, another comforter, another counsellor, one who would comfort and advise just as he had done. But he and his person could only speak to one personal group at a time. He would send his spirit who would be able to minister to all of his people at the same time. And so this was a promise to all believers. We have the assurance of the Holy Spirit drawing alongside us. He's there to advise, to assist, to teach, to comfort. The Greek word is paraclete. Para meaning alongside, as in the paramedical service, serving alongside the medics, and clete from the Greek word call. So the spirit is one who is called alongside us. He's called alongside us as our helper, our advocate, our counselor, someone who speaks in court on our behalf. He's our teacher and he's our guide. And after Christ had been raised from death and after he ascended into heaven, Christ fulfilled this promise and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And those very disciples who'd run away when Jesus had been arrested now were willing to preach boldly despite threats and intimidation. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit convicted people from all nations of their need of salvation and the church grew and multiplied even in the face of vicious persecution. And what about us today? Think again of that benediction that we have read in each of the talks. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What do we mean by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Well, the word fellowship in Greek is koinonia, and it means close association involving mutual interests and sharing. So in the New Testament, it was often used of a business partnership where there was mutual sharing and joint investment and working together. It's the Holy Spirit who draws us into relationship, partnership, communion with a triune God. 
He works in us personally to bring us into fellowship, community with the triune God. And we're going to look at five ways in which he does this. So firstly, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our need for salvation and he gives us new birth. The Father is the source of salvation, the fountainhead, the initiator, the one who chose us in all eternity. And the Son came to accomplish our salvation by his de life, death and resurrection and ascension. But the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to us to accomplish our salvation by convicting us of sin, drawing us to Christ and changing our hearts to give us new birth. So Jesus told the religious leader Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that Nicodemus needed to be born again and that rebirth, being born again, was an invisible work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit moves like the wind, says Jesus. We don't see the wind, but we see the effects of the wind. Now that was picking up on an amazing prophecy in the prophecy of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel saw a great valley filled with dry bones, dead bones. When the Spirit, the breath of God, breathed on those bones, they came together, were clothed in flesh, came to life and became a mighty army. What an incredible picture of the Holy Spirit bringing dead sinners to spiritual life. All true Christians are those who have been born again, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. As Paul writes, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. That's Romans chapter 8 verse 9. It's the Holy Spirit who brings us to faith, who, help, who, who, who enables us to accept Christ's grace. He convicts us of our sin. But that convicting work doesn't stop at conversion. We go on sinning and it's the Holy Spirit who continually prompts us to go on repenting, to come back to the cross. And if we're not enjoying the love of God, it could be that we're not listening when the Spirit convicts us. The psalmist said, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have heard. It's when we respond to the Spirit's work of conviction, when we live in daily repentance, that we enjoy closeness to God. Many years ago, I was challenged by reading the diaries of Anne Judson, the first female overseas missionary from America. She was converted at the age of 16, and her diaries written at that time demonstrate a deep conviction of sin and a powerful desire to be right with God. I should say, never underestimate how powerfully God can work in children and young people. Anne had been brought up in a Christian home. She'd always attended church. She believed the Bible, but up till then, she had never experienced personal conviction. If anything, she tended to feel that God probably owed her a favor because she was outwardly so good. But it all changed age 16, as she recorded in her personal diary. She wrote, I felt myself to be a poor, lost sinner. I knew I had nothing to recommend myself to God. I knew that naturally I wanted to follow evil. I knew that only the sovereign restraining mercy of God had protected me from committing the worst of crimes. I felt humble to the dust, broken with sorrow. I could only plead with Christ for forgiveness. I realized I could only be accepted by God because of what Christ had done. I felt I deserved only eternal punishment. That was the work. Of the Holy Spirit in Anne's heart. Secondly, the Holy Spirit communicates the love of the Father to us directly. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 reads, God has poured out his Holy Spirit, his love, into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given us. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And in Romans chapter 8 verse 16 we read, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And it's the Spirit of God who enables us to cry, Abba, Father. Paul elsewhere describes the gift of the Holy Spirit as a seal. In ancient times, people often had their personal seals so that they could stamp warm wax on a letter proving it was from them. God marks us, he says, she's mine, when he gives us the Holy Spirit. Paul also describes the indwelling Holy Spirit as a deposit or down payment, guaranteeing our salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 to 14 we read, Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, 
guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit teaches us the things of Christ. In John chapter 14, verse 26, we read, The counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, of course, in the first instance, Jesus was speaking to his disciples and the Holy Spirit would empower them to remember and record his words and works. And then it was recorded in scripture or scripture is inspired by God. But those words also apply to all Christ's followers because without the work of the Holy Spirit, we're blind and deaf to the truth of God's word. It's when the Spirit opens our eyes, our ears and our hearts that the word comes to us with power. Now, sometimes that work of the Spirit is gradual. Sometimes we have one-off crisis experiences. But day by day, as we go back to the Word, the Spirit opens our minds and teaches us. Or at times of crisis, it's the Holy Spirit who brings to our mind, at just the right moment, the promises of God. Or in times of deep darkness, the Word can flood into our souls like light. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And as we pray for those who are going through terrible trials, we can pray that the Holy Spirit would bring to their minds and their hearts the truth about God, remind them of promises, remind them of Bible verses. Fourthly, helping us to pray. Sometimes we just feel too weak, too discouraged to pray at all. Sometimes we have such heavy concerns that we can't even put them into words. The great apostle Paul was realistic about such times. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 27. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. But hope that is seen, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So Paul is realistic about our present sufferings. This world is in bondage to decay. It's subject to frustration. The creation itself is groaning. That's why we see sickness and suffering and illness and injustice, greed, warfare, pollution, death. And there are often times when we as believers groan inwardly. That's because at the moment we only have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are subject to decay. We're still tempted to sin. We're all growing older. And because we live in a sinful world, there are times when we bear burdens in our lives that we just can't articulate. We groan. But the wonderfully comforting thing is that the Holy Spirit within us is interceding for us and in us at such times. The idea is that he is carrying our inarticulate groans and cries to the Father, transforming them into acceptable prayers. Sometimes you might get the wrong idea that it's only strong, confident, articulate Christians who are full of the Spirit. Romans 8 is much more realistic and much more comforting. Not only when we are strong, but especially when we are weak and afflicted, the Holy Spirit enables us to pray. Paul himself admits weakness. He says we don't know what we should pray for because we don't see the future. We have limited wisdom. Sometimes we're just plain exhausted. How often do we find we're distracted when we try to pray? How often do we look back at prayers we've often in the past and realize we were asking for the wrong things? But at that point of weakness, the Holy Spirit draws alongside us and he intercedes in accordance with God's will. He knows exactly 
what to pray for. The word helps in Romans 8 verse 26 is wonderfully apt. The original word gives the sense of somebody coming alongside to lift a heavy burden. It's as if you were holding one end of a heavy plank and somebody came to lift the other end. So that word help indicates that we're not to be passive. It's not that we give up praying and say, oh, well, the Holy Spirit can pray for me. No, as we cry out to God, as we groan, the Spirit draws alongside. Yes, he intercedes for us, but he also comes into our hearts to guide us as to how to pray and to stir up that desire to pray. And as the comforter, he silences our fears and overcomes our reluctance to pray. As the helper, he enables us to overcome discouragement. All of our desire for God and our desire to pray comes from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And increasingly, the Holy Spirit gives us an ever increasing desire for God's glory. And so he empowers us to praise our great God and pray daily for God's name to be hallowed and his will to be done in every place. And then fifthly, the Holy Spirit transforms us. He not only comes to convict us and assure us and teach us and help us to pray, he works to make us holy. In Romans 8, Paul speaks of the Spirit living in us and says that by the Spirit, we put to death the misdeeds of the body. Now that's a violent image. It conjures up a picture of hand-to-hand -hand conflict in battle. One of the two contestants must die. And then the Bible speaks of the sword of the Spirit, which is, of course, the Word of God. And so the Christian life is not a passive letting go and letting God. We're to put sin to death, and it's the Spirit who helps us to do that by means of the Word. So how does this work out in practice? We pray that the Holy Spirit will convict us of remaining sin, maybe sins that we're blind to. As David prayed, keep your servant also from willful sins, may they not rule over me. And we determine not to do anything that Jesus would not be pleased with. And we ask the Holy Spirit to empower us to fight against sin. So several times in these talks I've mentioned the hymn writer Frances Ridley Havergal. Now, she found great joy in seeking to follow Christ and she wanted others to know that joy as well. She noticed with sadness that one of her best friends was often gossiping about other women. And she eventually wrote this gentle but challenging letter to her friend. She wrote, I've already had one bad night and several troubled wakings worrying about you and I better get it off my mind. I write to you as one who really wants to follow Jesus, wanting to live exactly according to his commands. And when this is the standard, what seems to be a very trivial thing is seen to be sin because it's disobeying his word. Jesus said, do to others as you would have them do to you. Would you like anyone to retell little incidents that make you appear tiresome or weak or silly? Everything which we say of another, which we wouldn't want them to say about us, unless said with some pure aim of which Jesus would approve, is transgression of this clear command. Jesus hears every word we speak. I know it's a temptation to allow oneself to say things which one wouldn't say if the person were present, but I've felt how even a momentary indulgence in the mildest forms of speaking evil prevent clear, unclouded communion with God. Well, that's brave and it's absolute, but it's, it's showing determination to obey God in every detail. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to seek to be wholly consecrated in that way. We need to remember that we are accountable to God for every thought and every word, as well as every deed. The work of the Holy Spirit is to transform us into the likeness of Christ. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, we all with open faces behold as in a glass, a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We're being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. And that transformation makes the Christian more and more like Jesus. And that's where we find the fruit of the Spirit coming into our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. When the Holy Spirit does that transforming work in us, he enables us to love others and want to serve others. And then he equips us with the necessary gifts with which to love and to serve. 
The point of gifts is that they're freely given for the good of the body. And the glory of the body of Christ is that we're all different and each member of the body can serve and minister to each other in diverse ways. And so the Holy Spirit works, energizing, equipping and strengthening believers for the building up of the body. Remember that serving in the church is not about us fulfilling ourselves or trying to use our gifts as if that's how it'll fulfill me. It's stepping in to serve the needs of others. Just as the Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to himself, his ministry shines a spotlight on Christ. So he helps us within the church to seek to look outwards to serve the needs of others for the glory of Christ. So I hope that we've seen from scripture that we can relate to the Holy Spirit in a personal way. The New Testament gives very clear commands regarding our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We're commanded to pray for the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 11 verse 13, Jesus says, If you then know your evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we can pray to know more of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. Jesus said in John 7, 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his inmost being will flow rivers of holy, living water. By this he meant the Spirit. We can pray for the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we're commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit. When we sin, he is said to be grieved. Ephesians 4, verse 30. The context there is unwholesome talk or complaining and negative talk. It grieves the Holy Spirit. That's personal. You can't grieve a force. Thirdly, we're commanded not to quench the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. The Holy Spirit works by fire to convict us of our sin and to purify us. And we quench the Spirit if we ignore him and resist him. Fourthly, we're commanded, therefore, following on from that, not to resist the Holy Spirit. In Acts 7, verse 51, Stephen told the Jews that they were resisting the Holy Spirit. They were holding the word in contempt. Similarly, in Acts 5, when Ananias and Sapphira made out to the church that they had given more than they really had, Peter said that they had lied to the Holy Spirit and he, he rebuked them for having agreed to test the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit wants us to be holy. We must not grieve him or quench his work or resist him or lie to him or test him. But finally, I want to conclude these three talks with a reminder that our glorious triune God invites us all to come to him. Like beautiful sparkling jewels, right through the scripture, there are loving invitations for us to return to our God. Scripture portrays God as not only inviting us back to himself, but looking out for us, wanting us to embrace him. So the father invites us back to himself. Think about that parable of the father waiting for his prodigal son, an exquisite picture of the deep love of God our father, picking up on that promise from Isaiah many hundreds of years before, how very gracious he, God, will be when you cry to him. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. That's Isaiah 30 verse 19. Then Jesus Christ invites us back to himself. In one of the most tender invitations of the whole of scripture, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. And then the Holy Spirit invites us into fellowship with the triune God for all eternity. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And let whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Revelation 22, 17. So whatever your situation, today, God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit invites you into communion with himself. Let's conclude with the words of the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.